Hey, and welcome to this section that we're going to look at today uh, in regards to paving stones. Uh, so, I've done a lot of paving stones um, in Western Canada, so Calgary and uh, since I moved out to Victoria. Um, so a lot of the slides that I'm going to go through today are going to highlight some of the products that we use out this way. Um, obviously there's a huge range of different colors and sizes and patterns um, that we want to think about in terms of different design features. Um, but yeah, you'll see a bunch of uh, sort of more uh, sleek and, uh, and classic looks in some of the stuff we'll go through today. Uh, so if you're familiar with paving stones, um, they're really nice segmental um, product to use, right? So pretty easy to move around. Um, obviously we have to focus on our base prep work, uh, which you can see in another course section. Um, and that's really the key to um, getting our uh, base prep properly is having that really good compaction, making sure our heights are all figured out and that everything is sloping correctly. Um, so those accuracies in the base prep and our screening layer, uh, which I'll show you shortly, um, really make a, re uh, a very refined finished result. So that's our main goal is to have that super nice, clean, flat, um, and sloping in the correct direction, uh, a nice smooth install. So. Uh, the nice thing about pavers too is that they're extremely durable, um, they're very highly engineered, um, so really good for different applications. So for uh, just a front entry way walking surface or even vehicle traffic, right? Um, so when they're done really well, they can last an extremely long amount of time, plus being segmental we can take them apart and redo sections quite easily as opposed to having to uh, re-pour a whole bunch of concrete or asphalt or something like that. So always uh, some good benefits there. Um, plus the range of colors and sizes makes it really interesting. Uh, so we can create some really cool looks. Uh, we can use different colored borders uh, to create some really nice uh, detail and uh, separation of spaces as far as our designs are concerned. Uh, and it gives lots of options for clients as well. Uh, I typically like to keep things pretty reserved as far as uh, design and, uh, and options that I'm going to give to my clients. Um, but you can really go as, as crazy with it as you want um, with different inlays, patterns. Um, there's even some really cool people doing um, like CNC'd uh, pre-cut sections. So you basically just drop um, like a, let's say like a compass or something like that really uh, really unique into the center of a patio. Uh, so lots of fun stuff we can do with that. All right, so as far as designs, uh, there's lots of different shape, color, and texture options available. Um, I'm gonna show you a project that uh, I worked on here in Victoria, um, basically turning an old asphalt driveway into um, some separated spaces for some patio use. Uh, the nice thing about the design features with pavers too is that we can mix and match different colors to create those borders, uh, different types of infills, um, and some interest uh, to contrast and as well as to complement. Uh, so we want these smooth, smooth surfaces to sort of flow uh, from one use to another, um, but also want to use our borders and stuff to sort of make spaces feel separate in some instances. So for example, you might have like a separate rectangular or square patio area amongst a larger paving and stone installation, but you might sort of set that area aside with a specific border for dining uh, or for more of like a um, sort of outdoor living room type thing. So lots of fun ways we can do that. Uh, often we want to choose our sizing of our pavers as well based on the application. So there's some sort of larger format pavers that kind of border on whether or not they're a paver or not. Um, that we can use in foot traffic installations. Um, but we want to make sure that we use um, sort of the smaller, uh, more engineered vehicle appropriate ones for anything to do with uh, vehicle traffic. So here's an example of um, some separation of space using a couple different colors, a uh, very simple design. Um, but the nice thing about this particular paver is that it's uh, it's really clean, it has sort of a rougher texture which is nice, and uh, it just creates a pretty sleek look. Uh, three different sizes and you can get a ton of different color options. 
um, but you can play with the sizes, right? So the sizes and the colors as well, uh, even with one specific type of paper can help us uh, create some interest and contrast here. So let's get started on some actual installation information. Um, heights can be a little bit tricky when we're dealing with pavers. Uh, the biggest thing is that we want to account for the compaction of each of our layers when we're doing our install. So our road base layers are going to be compacted, right? Um, so in no greater than three or four inch lifts at a time. Uh, so we need to account for that compaction when we get up to our final height. Um, our sand or bedding layer is going to have about an inch of material and that will compact as well when we actually compact the top surface of the pavers after. Uh, so usually I want to end up about a quarter inch above any existing surface uh, before we compact the top of the paver. And that'll leave the paver sitting just a hair above that existing surface, like existing concrete or whatever we're matching up to. Um, so that over time, when it does settle down just a little bit more over the course of five, ten years, um, it'll stay pretty consistently flush. Uh, some buildings are set up for uh, two inches under the siding to be uh, an air gap. So we want to take that into consideration. Um, and there's also some buildings that are set up for the door threshold um, to be pretty flush with the finished surface on the outside. So just take note depending on the scenario. Um, but just know that like standard practice is to leave that two inch air gap underneath siding. Uh, that just allows for like airflow, make sure that uh, any sort of wall system behind the siding has enough room for uh, the moisture and air to move behind it, right? So always a good idea and it kind of helps keep the, um, the siding or whatever material it is from holding moisture if we put pavers up against it. So always take that into account. Uh, pretty standard as well, we want to slope away from our buildings. So um, designing which direction to slope can be a little bit tricky depending on the scenario and I'll show you a couple of options here in a bit. Um, ideally we want to slope towards our drains as well so we want that minimum amount of slope to the drains. Uh, typical minimum slope is 1%. Um, usually I go just a little bit more than that just to make sure that water is going to flow nicely um, but we don't want to go too drastic of a slope because it's going to start to feel awkward. right? especially if we have to have a drain in the center of the patio. Uh, we don't want to have too drastic of a slope coming from all directions towards it um, because this overall surface isn't going to feel very flat for, um, let's say, more of like a living room setup. Um, if there is a table and chairs directly in the center over the top of the drain, uh, that might actually kind of work um, because around it, if you set it up right in the center, um, like the table won't wobble as much if it's right over it. Um, so. Designing for that in mind is key. Um, I always like to try to slope everything in one direction and then use more of like a California style drain or a trench drain um, along one edge to keep the whole surface feeling really nice and flat, but it does indeed have that consistent slope on the whole thing. Uh, also take note for the height of each individual paver. So if you're doing multiple types, uh, we need to sort of adjust our road base and sand layers uh, for that thickness, right? Um, and yeah, each project is going to be a little different if we're using different uh, types of pavers on different projects. So you might have to reset up your screed boards or bars um, to a different height just to take that into account. So always double check that before you get too carried away with your base prep. Yeah, this is what I usually like to see for the sand. Uh, the finished sand layer just so that I can compact down about a quarter inch. It actually might be just a little bit high on the left side there. But that's what we're looking for to be sitting just above before we do our compaction on that finished surface, right? So here's a typical side profile of just a standard road base paving stone installation. Uh, obviously, the game changes a little bit if we're doing an open graded base, right? So it's definitely going to look quite a bit different, um, but the same principles apply and the same kind of design things that we're talking about as well. Uh, so pedestrian traffic, we have our four to six inches minimum. Uh, usually we go six inches minimum just to be safe. Uh, compacted in layers, 
And then we lay our bedding sand layer down really precisely, uh, usually one inch, and our paper on top of that. Um, the reason why we use a bedding sand uh, typically is because we want the sand layer to actually push up the joints of the pavers when they're compacted, as well as our joint sand to be forced down into the joints of the pavers. Uh, so we're sort of locking it up from the bottom and the top. Um, so that's a really key point that I think a lot of contractors really um, don't understand or they, um, they just ignore for whatever reason. Um, but that really helps with the whole um, locking up of the whole surface and creating that tension that locks each and every paper together and creates a strength in between all of them. Um, that is really the strength of a proper paving stone install. And one of the reasons why heights are so important um, are things like this, like for a gate to line up. Uh, it has to be really well thought out. Uh, we don't want to be like chopping down the bottom of the metal after the fact, right? Uh, so thinking about our heights before we get too carried away with our base prep and all that um, can allow you to sort of hone things in really accurately and, uh, and make sure it's going to work. So slopes and drains, uh, minimum 1%, and that's from the farthest point, right? So usually when I'm doing a slope calculation in the field, um, and you can see this in my site prep section, uh, we want to measure the longest point physically from that long point all the way to the drain and then make sure we have our minimum 1% slope on that. So I'll usually do a length measurement, uh, convert that to inches, and then times that by 1%. And then what I'm doing is using my heights, so taking my laser level, shooting it from the high point to the drain with a grade stake set up there. And then if I have that level point transferred, I can measure down 1%. Once I calculate it, and then I know my height, uh, what it should be at the drain, and that I for sure have that amount of slope there. Um, that'll make more sense if you want to go through my uh, my slopes section in site prep. Uh, like I said, ideally we want to slope the entire patio or walkway in one direction as well. Uh, that just helps it all feel nice and flat, um, but sometimes we're sort of tied to having a drain in a bit more of an awkward spot if we have like bench seating around the patio. Or something like that. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, in areas where a drain is required, uh, so we want to yeah, set it up for the maximum usable space. Uh, so don't just throw a drain in anywhere is the main point, right? Um, select where you want it um, for the use of the actual patio. Um, not just what makes sense to you, but what makes sense for the actual use uh, for your clients in the future as well, right? Um, in awkward areas where we have multiple slopes kind of converging, so we might have a pathway coming into a patio, um, usually we want to make sure that each surface has that minimum 1%, um, but where they meet, we might actually have to fine tune that. Um, so if we lay our bars down on each side, screed our sand, we might notice that there's a bit of a ridge um, or a dip there. Uh, so usually I'll take some sand and a small level and sort of just fine tune that area by hand. So using just a straight edge you know, with some extra sand and just making sure that that sand layer looks really nice and smooth in between the two. So it's not gonna be like two awkward angles matching up with our papers, right? So you can definitely feel free to do that and, uh, and just help smooth those out. Uh, a simple point here for choosing drains is to ideally choose one that matches the size and scale of our pavers. Uh, so not like an awkward size, or if we're using a nice larger square paver, um, we wouldn't use a round drain, right? We'd use a square one. Uh, so just take a look at what options you have for that and make sure that the drain itself looks nice and sort of works with the whole patio as well. You don't want it to be an eyesore. Um, and yeah, use a specific type of drain for, for once again, selecting um, the location. So if it's a channel drain, it's on the one side where we can easily drain to um, so that there's more usable space on the patio and also we're setting it up right when we do our layout for any drain especially a long skinny one um, making sure that it's going to be parallel to our pavers and that it's actually going to work to our pattern uh, usually we're setting our drain in that road base layer so if it's not perfectly square or parallel to the patio 
um, if we don't pull our measurements or even set up a string line to do that, uh, it's going to be pretty awkward when we have our pavers running out all the way over there and there's an angle on it, right? So we'll see that in our cuts on the pavers. Uh, so we want to make sure that we pre-think all that. Uh, even to the point we're making sure that it's going to actually line up without an awkward sliver cut there, right? So something to think about. So here's an example of a section of walkway coming out from an older uh, existing patio uh, to a new area that we created. Um, so you can see how it lines up nicely to the drain, which was existing, so we kind of had to match up to it. And uh, yeah, just creating a nice smooth transition there, and also using the different colors and borders. Um, so the key with this type of install is that those lines need to be really crisp, right? So we need to make sure that we're pulling our lines really square and parallel from the building at the beginning. And, and keeping tabs on it to make sure we're not getting too far off course as we lay, uh, which tends to happen if we're going a little bit too frantically. Uh, so setting up string lines to make sure that that, that soldier's course especially is really nice and straight, uh, but not just straight, but actually square and parallel as well. So using our string lines for that. This is from my slopes video, just showing uh, level and then 1% and 2% slope. Um, but we really want to get comfortable with our string lines, right? <clears throat> string lines add that uh, level of accuracy, not just in our actual physical layout, but in our heights as well. So if you have some string lines and some grade stakes um, and you haven't done a lot of this before, I definitely recommend just heading out in your yard, uh, setting up some uh, string lines in a few different patterns. So I'll give you a few examples here. And I actually have an exercise um, at the end of this section of the course uh, that you can take a look at and do some examples with. Um, I find it really handy just to get out and actually physically do this, um, especially if you have a laser level. Uh, if not, you can actually just use your level and hold it up to the string line. Uh, ideally a four or six foot length level is, is the best way to go. And you can shoot those lines around and try to get the string lines super nice and square. So using a three, four, five method, which I'll show you in a sec. Uh, shoot our level heights. So pick a height um, that you would ideally match up to like an existing level of concrete or just a height that works well in the landscape. And then transfer that height, the level line, on all the stakes. And then you can use that as a reference to measure down or up from when we're actually gonna put slope on those. Okay, so you, then you can map out some squares and rectangles and circles, all that fun stuff, and adjust our slopes once we have our string lines set up where we need them uh, for the finished grades as well. And then we know how far to excavate, um, exactly the height of the finished surface, whether or not it's going to be sloped, and uh, we have something to work up to. So feel free to uh, use these examples as well. You can pause them here and, uh, and head out and give it a try. Um, usually for any kind of just like uh, hands-on field exercise like this, I'll set up a baseline, something to work off of that we're sort of pretending to be the foundation of a building. So just simply set up a string line and use that as a reference point for uh, where to measure from. So that's what we typically start with. We're usually pulling the length of the foundation of the house out to somewhere where it's easy for us to measure to. So setting up a string line nice and parallel to that. And then we can do uh, simply measure six feet from the two points and a length measurement across at eight feet, set up our first two pins. <clears throat> then we need to figure out how to actually lay out the next two. So I'll just skip through a couple of these, but the next one is gonna be with a slope on it. So the first one we'd set up level. And this one, you can try to set it up with 1% slope in one direction. And then the same with a circle pattern as well. So I'll show you how to do that here in a sec. And also, if you want to give it a try, um, a square with a drain in the middle to make sure we have our minimum slopes from the farthest corners. It's a really good idea. Okay. So here's um, just a quick square layout, and I'm just going to show you how to pull a three, four, five. So I set up my pins in all four corners. Um, that's the main goal. Um, this is actually to set up our slope. 
So once we get a level mark all the way around, um, I'm gonna, yeah, map that level point on all four corners and then choose a direction of slope, measure the length, convert it to inches so it's easy, times that by 1% or 2%, and then simply from our level lines, measure down and that'll be uh, set precisely at one or two percent. So that's our choice that we have to make for um, our slopes. So one percent is usually bare minimum. Two percent is uh, is quite a bit of slope. So you might want to go somewhere in between one point five percent or so. Um, yeah, it's a really nice simple exercise to get uh, our slopes figured out. So to set up a square, let me just jump out here. I want to. Yeah. So we'll set up a square in just a sec. I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, so I'll double back on that in just a minute. And you can always jump back in the video here and pause it there as well. Um, but that's the general idea for sloping, is to set up our perimeter stakes and then shoot that level line around. So once we have an actual mark where our level point is on all four corners, we can choose a direction of slope and then simply do a length measurement times that by our percentage of slope and measure down or up from our level marks. And then we just simply set up our string lines on those marks. The nice thing about that too is that it's a good visual to have the actual benchmark height on the stake. And then I'll even use a separate color for my slope marks so that I know exactly where level is and that I've actually put the string line in the correct spot and can reference it later if I have to take the string lines down and set them up again. All right, uh, so I'll show you some squaring up of the patio and stuff in a sec here, but uh, first I just want to talk about screening. Uh, so once we have our string line set up and we get our base prep all dialed in, so we have that top layer of our base prep really precisely screeded uh, to our finished height that we want. So usually I'll take a two by four and uh, cut it down or make a mark on it of the exact height of my paver and sand layer um, minus the compaction. And then that'll give me a good reference for um, scraping that top layer of road base to the correct height. Um, so then we can put our bars down. So I usually use a one inch square tubing, which uh, we can get at like our local metal supermarket here, which is nice. Uh, you can also use round tubing as well, whatever you prefer. Um, and I'm gonna set up the bars on the road base and just put a paver on it and double check that it matches up to the existing height of whatever I'm trying to get to, right? So that I'm sitting just that quarter inch above um, because that sand layer is gonna be the height of the bars. So that's exactly where we wanna be set up. Uh, ideally, like we're setting up our bars in sections. So we're gonna set it up in sort of a grid so that we can pull our sand across and work our way out because we don't wanna be walking on the sand. Uh, and ideally, I like to set up the bars with the direction of our slope. So that's a really nice sort of key thing that helps keep our slope going where we want it. It makes it easy for us to just put a level on the bars and make sure that we're sloping in the right direction. Um, but if we do our road base prep really precisely, um, it should be pretty simple. You might just need a little bit of fine tuning of the bars to get them perfect. And if you're setting it up on a big patio and you have a long row, so like over 20 feet, um, definitely make sure that the bars are really level in between each other in the direction that they will be level, right? Um, so that if you have to fine tune them even like an eighth of an inch uh, with a little bit of sand or mallet them down into the road base just a tiny bit, uh, do that so that top surface is even more precise. Um, you just need to decide on the workflow, so the best access point from where your material is coming in, and then sort of work back to that point, right? And ideally, you're only screening a section for how much you can lay that one day um, and no more because it'll probably get messed up a little bit by uh, random animals overnight. Um, or if you even if you cover it with a tarp, it might get a little bit messed up just from the tarp itself. Um, or, yeah, if rain's going to hit, hit it, then it's not going to be ideal to lay on the next day. Right. So this is like just a nice example of kind of mid screed so i still need to fill in the uh, hole where the rails were um, but you can see that sand layer is really going to be the same as the finished surface right so if our sand layer is really nice and precise and screeded well 
Um, that's going to translate right up to the top layer of the papers. And here's just a quick video and some screening as well. So working back towards my sand pile, set up the bars, I'm just dumping sand kind of to the sides, quick spread, and then using a nice straight edge to pull back on the bars to get the sand screeded back really nice and flat. And you can see the string line set up still just for a finished heights, just to make sure we're um, going to be as accurate as we need to be everywhere. Plus they're uh, set up not just for heights, but also as a reference for um, our layout too. So keeping things nice and parallel and square to the house. Okay, before I get into layout and laying tips, I'm just going to pause the video and I'll split it up into the next section. Okay, so if you want to jump back and do a couple of those um, layout exercises, uh, feel free to do that or we'll continue on in the next section in just a sec. All right.